earlier there was a mix up with the time and there's lots of traffic on the way uh, here from Birmingham. Uh, inshallah, today we're going to be speaking in the time we have on uh, the topic was post Ramadan recalibration. And the aim and the goal of this uh, lecture is, in fact, for it not to be a lecture as maybe we normally have. But inshallah, I wanted to change things up a little bit and do a workshop instead. So those of you who are at the back, you'll have to come forward because we're going to be doing uh, some type of group work, inshallah. So the aim and the goal with this program, inshallah, is to reflect and look at this past Ramadan which we've gone through and we ask Allah to accept all of our good deeds in the blessed month of Ramadan and how we can move forward and how we can develop as Muslims going forward post Ramadan and this is why it's called post Ramadan recalibration looking at how we can you know reorganize recalibrate you know change the way we uh, we worship Allah not the way we worship Allah but the way we uh, the way we think the way we act and behave as Muslims and how we can improve ourselves so I'm going to give you a series of questions and then we'll discuss these questions once you've discussed it amongst yourselves and I'd like you to get into groups of two or three and inshallah answer these questions amongst yourselves <clears throat> and then inshallah we'll see what everybody has and then we can discuss uh, some of those answers and we can discuss the questions and what we can do moving forward inshallah so the first question is related to Ramadan the first question is related to Ramadan how the Ramadan went and more specifically what did you find easy what did you find easy in the month of Ramadan what did you find easy in the month of Ramadan so in groups of two or three if you can get into groups of two or three okay and uh, uncle as well inshallah everybody into groups of two or three what did you find easy in the month of Ramadan so I'll give you a couple of minutes what did you find easy in the month of Ramadan what did you find easy in the month of Ramadan? Okay, inshallah. So, uh, let's see what you guys have. What did you find easy in the month of Ramadan? You can be as specific as you as you want, inshallah. What did you find easy? Yeah. Okay, mashallah. Qiyamul Layl. You found easy in the month of Ramadan. Okay, good. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Taraweeh. Yeah. So, Taraweeh is normally is referred to for after Isha. <coughs> Qiyamul Layl is referred to referring to the Salah which is done prior to Fajr. But really, it's all you can all, you can call it all Qiyamul Layl. But yeah, good. Okay, sorry, brother. Reading okay, reading Quran, reciting Quran. Yeah, yeah. Fasting. Fasting. Yeah, over there. You had your hand up. Yeah. Okay, yeah, fasting we mentioned. Yeah. Giving sadaqah. Okay, giving charity. Avoiding bad deeds. Okay, avoiding bad deeds. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, reciting Quran. So, uh, making dua, supplicating. So, recognizing that these things we found easy, the question is why was it easy to do in the month of Ramadan? And there are some, some answers which are quite clear from what we know, based on what we know. Why did we find these easy in the month of Ramadan? There's the obvious answer. So, the month of Ramadan is a month which is Mubarak, it's a blessed month. And the famous hadith of the shayateen. Mm. 
the shayateen are chained, and so it's easier for a person to do good deeds. It's easier for a person to increase in good deeds. Uh, it's harder for a person to commit sins. It's harder for a person to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's why it's easier for a person to recite Quran. Maybe a person recites more Quran in Ramadan than he does outside of Ramadan the whole year. Maybe a person... Yeah, the reward is also multiplied. So maybe there's that encouragement. Also, also the, this year the night was very long, but very shortly. Okay, yeah, so the night and day as well, the length of them. So it's easier for a person to do good deeds. It's easier for a person to pray, for a person to recite Quran. Allah is facilitating out of his mercy uh, ease for the slave to be able to increase in good deeds in the month of Ramadan for his own benefit. And we can learn from this the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the uh, rahmah of Allah azza wa jal on the slaves. He's facilitating and making it easier for us to be able to worship him. And you may have noticed it's, it's harder for a person to commit sins, meaning it takes more effort. Another, what are some of the other reasons it may be easier for, for a person to do good deeds in the month of Ramadan? Yeah, the, the, the communal uh, feeling in the month of Ramadan, meaning everyone's fasting, which uh, non-Muslims obviously don't fast, but Muslims, everyone's fasting. Yeah. Yeah, so for Salah, you go to the masjid, everyone's in the masjid. Now just imagine, subhanAllah, there were loads of people, the same num numbers of people attending the regular five daily prayers. That would change, you know, the community. Because if everyone starts attending, the, the, the level of, you know, uh, ibadah and uh, the ukhuwa and brotherhood amongst people, it would be on a different level. So uh, Allah is making it easier for people. Uh, as a result of everyone doing the same thing, it's easier for people to fast. It's easier for people to recite Quran. People are reciting Quran in the, in the masjid, in their homes. People are maybe, you're on the bus or you're, you know, you're on your way to work or something and you see people reciting Quran when they maybe normally wouldn't. And so when you see others doing good deeds, it reminds you to also do good deeds. So you, read, you end up reading more Quran, you end up you know, being more observant when it comes to your fast and the quality of your fast. The salawat, you know, you uh, maybe might be lazy on some days, you don't want to go for the taraweeh prayer and isha prayer, but then you know, you, you know that there will be other people there who will be going to the masjid, and so you end up going as well. So, you know, as a result of everyone doing the same thing, everyone uh, worshipping Allah and doing those same good deeds and worshipping Allah Azza wa at that time, it's a means of encouragement for a person to be able to also uh, do good deeds. So we've spoken about what's easy in the month of Ramadan. Uh, second question, what did, you, <clears throat> what did you find difficult in the month of Ramadan? What did you find difficult in the month of Ramadan? So again, I'll give you a minute or so in your groups, what did you find difficult in the month of Ramadan? So it may have been some acts of worship, maybe. Or it could be other things. So what did you find difficult in the month of Ramadan?
Okay, inshallah. So, uh, what did you find difficult in the month of Ramadan? At the back, right at the back. Okay, waking up for suhoor. Yeah, waking up for suhoor. Anybody else? Yeah, over there in the blue t shirt. After suhoor. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good one actually. Yeah, going back to sleep after suhoor. Yeah, brother? Okay, just feeling generally, just feeling tired uh, in the daytime. What was the reason for that? Work, okay, yeah. Over oh, there, the brother in the green uh, soap. Going to school, okay. That's difficult anyway, isn't it? Like, uh, just not, not in Ramadan, it's just generally just difficult, yeah. Standing up for later to the Qadr, yeah. Just generally your sleep routine. In the month of Ramadan, yeah, over there next to him. Uh, staying, in the staying, staying in the masjid overnight for like eight, for eight to kaf. Yeah, okay. That's eight to kaf is quite difficult. I've done it myself. It's not easy yet. Yeah. Okay, the hunger issue. Yeah, anybody else? Stewarding. Stewarding is difficult. Yeah, all the people complaining and, and being annoying and not listening. Yeah. Working in the month of Ramadan. Okay, so it's, yeah. Okay, yeah, especially if you're at school, right? You're at work, yeah. Non Muslims just uh, stuffing themselves, yeah. Okay, good. Did you, we're gonna put your hand up. Say, say again, okay. You mean running around like doing being active, like PE and things like that? Okay, good, yeah. Yes, brother. Yeah, okay, good. So if we notice, a lot of these uh, issues that we had <clears throat> is around uh, routine. It's around like lifestyle, routine, uh, just the uh, change in, in routine that we have in the month of Ramadan when it comes to our uh, sleep schedules, for example, when it comes to uh, waking up for suhoor, when it comes to uh, you know uh, hunger and being more active and just feeling tired as a result of maybe staying up uh, later uh, at, at night because of taraweeh and qiyam and maybe because of suhoor and so you're tired during the day so uh, what do we learn from these issues that people find difficult in the month of ramadan so we've spoken about you know hunger and suhoor and qiyam and these kinds of things. What lessons can we learn from these things that people found difficult in the month of Ramadan? Because everything is about taking lessons. Okay, so it's the practical aspects. So before people were saying, in terms of what they found easy, Quran, you know, Salah wasn't necessarily hard in and of itself once you're here. It's not hard for a person to you know, stay, maybe if you're really tired or if you had a busy day. But generally speaking, salah, the fast itself, maybe some people felt hungry. But generally, the spiritual aspects weren't as difficult. It was more the routine and the, the kind of lifestyle that a person had. And again, this shows us the barakah and the blessing of Ramadan. And it also shows us that uh, possibly our routines weren't in a way conducive to worshipping Allah generally outside of Ramadan. How so? Because the Prophet ﷺ was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قليلا. Stand up in the night except for a, a small amount, a short amount. The Prophet ﷺ would pray during the night, Qiyam, every single night. Uh, for the majority of the night. Nisfahu or in Qusmin Huqalila. Half of it or less than that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi minimum, he would pray half of the night. Minimum. That's the minimum. And this was the routine of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the routine of the companions Radiallahu Anhu Majma'in. And if you look throughout history, in terms of accomplishments, in terms of accomplishments and spreading Islam and conquering lands and you know giving da'wah and calling others to Islam and you know spreading Islam, who accomplished the most? Which generation? The generation of the Sahaba, the companions, and they were praying most of the night. Now, most of us would think if you want to do you know a lot, if we want to make a lot of effort, or if we want to. Uh, you know, do a lot in the daytime, we need to have lots of sleep. 
We need to rest. But you look at the companions, radiallahu anhu, majma'in, they will sleep, you know, a few hours in the night. The famous hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, speaking to Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu. And he would say, uh, what a great person Abdullah ibn Umar is. If only he prayed more during the night. If only he prayed more during the night. He was already praying in the night. But the Prophet is saying, if only he prayed more. And so when he had this, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu would pray even more and he would never miss the night of night prayer. So a lot of those things are related to our routine. Waking up for suhoor. You know, uh, a person waking up for suhoor, not being used to eating so much at that time. Maybe you don't feel like eating. And again, it goes back to how much did a person fast before Ramadan? Because if you were fasting before Ramadan, then you would be waking up for suhoor also. And if you're waking for suhoor, if you're waking up for suhoor once or twice a week uh, for every month before Ramadan came, would it be hard to, to wake up for suhoor in Ramadan? It wouldn't be hard because you're doing it anyway. So the routine of waking up for suhoor actually wouldn't have been difficult if you were doing it before Ramadan. And, you know, eating certain amounts of food, what you're going to eat, how much are you going to eat, when, when exactly should I wake up, should I wake up five minutes before suhoor, you know, to save time, should I bring my food upstairs, so I don't have to go downstairs, you know, what am I going to eat, should I microwave food or make it the night before and have it in the fridge, what should I do, you know, all those kinds of questions wouldn't, you wouldn't have to worry about. Because you, you've been fasting since last Ramadan, every, you know, two, three, uh, two, three times a week. And then the issue of, uh, again, hunger goes back to what you were eating. So if a person eats properly, eats correctly, eats the right types of food, then he won't have any issues you know, of feeding hunger during the day. And he's, he pre he's preoccupied. And your body becomes used to the amount of food you eat. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, on some days, all we would have to eat and drink was al-aswadan, the two black things. What is she referring to? Dates. Dates, what's the other thing? Water. Who said water? Did you say water? Excellent. Mashallah. Well done. Water. Aisha radiallahu anha calls it the two black things, which is very interesting. Why does she call water a black thing? Because the water in the water was dirty. It wasn't clean. It was dirty water. So water from the well 1,400 years ago wasn't like crystal clear what we get from the taps today. It was murky water. And it was called al-aswadan, the two black things. Anha, she says that we used to have on some days all we had was just dates and water that's all we would eat that's all we would have so your body the point is your body gets used to the amount of food and drink you eat and this is why you know the Roman Empire the Persian Empire okay, they would be shocked when they would see Muslim armies advancing over the desert and they'd be completely fine be like, what's going on here? You guys coming from the desert, you don't have any food on you, any any water. Khalid Walid radiallahu an, the famous stories of him crossing the crossing the desert, you know, and arriving to fight the Romans, and they'll be shocked. Where did these guys come from? What, what kind of people are they are, are they? They're not even, you know, tired or hungry or thirsty. And when they were, when the Romans would travel, they would have they would have to make sure they have a long line of uh, you know uh, food and water trickling down through the army so that they don't starve or they don't uh, they don't become thirsty and they don't die of starvation or, or thirst. So the point is your your body adapts to the amount of food that you eat. And again, this is uh, some people mentioned hunger uh, during the day. If you're used to eating a short amount of food like we mentioned, if you were fasting before, then it wouldn't have been an issue, in fact. It would have been okay. Because your body becomes used to it. You know, they say, I'm not, I'm not an expert in, in health or anything. I'm, maybe there's some doctors here. Any doctors here? They say that when a person eats less, the stomach starts to shrink. Is that true? Am I making this up? Or Yeah? So, they say, are you a doctor, brother? No, I'm not. No? Oh, okay. So, you're, so you're nodding because you're like saying this, I'm a doctor. Yeah, any doctors here? Anyone? No, for sure? From what I know, the stomach shrinks when a person eats less. So then when the time for iftar comes, okay, and you eat, I think we mentioned this before Ramadan, I think those of you who are here, about being careful about how much you eat. When you eat a short, a small amount of food, the stomach feels full, even though you haven't eaten that much, because the stomach is so used to not having that much food. So looking back at the companions, they would have a short amount, a small amount of food, but it was fine. They wouldn't feel hungry because that's what they were used to. When you have huge amounts of food, 
and your stomach expands, it's expecting the same amount of food. And so, uh, one of the things which nobody mentioned, uh, but one of the things maybe we might have found difficult, maybe I, I found it difficult at some points, is not being able to judge or estimate how much food you should have for iftar. Like you look at the food, and you know that we have a saying in our, in our, in our language that uh, the eyes are never satisfied. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they say the eyes are never satisfied. You know, a person, he, he sees the food and he thinks, oh, you know, I can eat this and I can eat this and I can, this is fine, like I'll, eat, I'll have all of this. Mm-hmm. I'll have some of the chips and some of the samosa and some of the kebabs and some roti and sardan and some chava and some rice and this. And he puts it all in his plate and he thinks this is fine. And he's hungry. He's thinking, I'm so hungry. I can eat all this. And he has like a, he has dates and some water and he th- his brain is saying, that's it. Like, you don't need any food. But, you know, your eyes and your, your heart is saying, no, no, I have to eat. Like, this is my mission today, right now. I have to eat this food. And so you end up eating more than what's necessary. You don't need all that food. And that has a knock-on effect when it comes to salah and qiyam and you know, taraweeh and standing in the day. That's why, interestingly, when we were in Medina, iftar would be in the haram. And they would give us, they would give iftar there, they would give dates, they would give uh, bread with yogurt. If anybody's been to uh, Medina or Mecca in Ramadan, they give dates, um, bread with yogurt, they give a little like a uh, pouch of uh, masala, like light masala, they put it on the yogurt and you have that. Sometimes they give hais, which is like a, it's like a mixture of dates and and wheat, uh, and flour. So it's like a it's like a uh, like a date paste or something you could call it. Uh, and that's all you have. That's all we would have. And then you would pray maghrib, and then you would stay in the masjid until isha, and you would pray taraweeh, and you wouldn't feel tired at all because you're not heavy. You don't feel heavy. So all of these things are related to Ramadan. The point is, brothers and sisters that I'm trying to get to is the fact that the issues that we had are as a result of our lifestyle. It's because of the lifestyles that we led. It's not to do with, of course, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal not facilitating because the mercy of Allah was vast. You know, it was easier for a person to do good deeds. But it's about uh, what uh, a person was doing before Ramadan that had an effect on his performance in the month of Ramadan when it came to his ibadah when it came to his worship. So understanding this and now reflecting, now that the month of Ramadan has finished, I want you now to answer another question, question number three. What differences have you noticed between Ramadan and Shawwal this month? Any differences? Okay, it could be anything. It could be to do with one's deen or lifestyle or whatever it is. Anything. What differences did you notice between Ramadan and this month of Shawwal? So I'll give you a couple of minutes, inshallah. What differences have you noticed? It could be anything. There's no. Spe- I'm not asking for something specific here. Just general. What differences did you notice between Ramadan and this month of Shawwal? So a couple of minutes, inshallah. A couple of minutes, inshallah.
Okay, inshallah. So, uh, what differences have you noticed between Ramadan and Shawwal, this month that we're in now? Yes, brother. Uh, Masajid complaining, we use people to pray, is that it? Masajid. Okay, so numbers. And Quran, Quran complaining. Also, people reading Quran. Okay. They used to eat that before. Okay, okay, good. So a person, uh, less people coming to the masjid uh, for salah, a uh, person maybe reciting less Quran, yeah, and a person going back to the amount of food he used to eat before Ramadan, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Less peaceful, okay. What do you mean? Can you explain what you mean? Okay, less peaceful, okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Yes, brother. Okay, you mean uh, good or bad? Okay, that's good. Alhamdulillah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a very good point. A person's more careful in the month of Ramadan. Why is he more careful? Because he's, because he's fasting. Meaning, subhanAllah, you know, uh, fasting is an ibadah. It's an ibadah that you're doing from sunrise to sunset. So while you're in a state of ibadah, you're constantly being careful about what you are going to do and what you're going to say. Just naturally. And of course, uh, fasting is something which is a sunnah anyway. So it really heightens a person's sense of awareness with regards to his actions and his, you know, his statements, the things he says and the things he does. And this really shows you the virtue and the benefit of fasting. It puts a person in a heightened state of ibadah. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, you'll normally find uh, two things happen. One or two things will happen. And this, to be honest, is all connected to how a person was before Ramadan, really, and his state of mind. Before Ramadan, during Ramadan, affects post-Ramadan. Sometimes a person will be in Ramadan, okay, and he can't wait for Ramadan to finish so he can go back to doing the things he was doing before Ramadan in terms of haram. Bad habits. So he's thinking to himself, you know, I can't wait for Eid. Because once Ramadan finishes, you know, I'm, I'm back in action. I'm going to be doing all the things that I used to do before. I doesn't want to, doesn't even wait. Like, wait a few days or, you know, a week or so, or a couple of weeks. No, no, first day, Eid day. And obviously, you know, our Shabbat, we see the youth sometimes and they, they end up doing haram things, and, you know, music and singing and drugs and alcohol and all, the, uh, all these kinds of things. It happens, you know, you get young Muslims who are not, you know, practicing and this is what they do. You know, after a month of, mashallah, fasting and worshipping Allah, they go back and regress back to what they were doing. So sometimes people are of the mindset that we're going to go back to doing the things and they even start planning. Like, this is what I'm going to be doing. You know, this is what I'm going to go back to. In Ramadan, they're thinking, this is what I'm going to go back to after Ramadan finishes, first day, you know, of Shawwal or, you know, after, after Eid, for example. And if that's the way they're thinking, then that's what's going to happen. Because that's something which is on their mind. Uh, study, you know, before Shaitan did change, sometimes Shaitan change the people, and come back, still the same thing. Yeah. So again, the brother's mentioning shay Shaitan. You know, we mentioned Shaitan in Ramadan. The shayateen are chained. And so when the shayateen are uh, unchained post-Ramadan, we see it straight away, even in ourselves. Let's be honest, like all of us, we can, we can feel those desires are more so, and it's uh, more difficult to prevent oneself from committing sins on the first day of Shawwal than it was the day before in the month of Ramadan. Like the day of Ramadan finishes, after Maghrib it's Shawwal, and it's like, you know, things change it's not the same anymore so you know we see clear differences and then that's one group the other group there's an active intention there's a intention what's the intention for after Ramadan to try to to try to be different to try to change to try to increase in good deeds 
to try to be a, a better Muslim, to try to be a more practicing Muslim, to try and change. And the first step for a person to increase in his ibadah, for a person to be better as a Muslim, is to you know, make the intention, to have the, that intention in his heart, to make the preparations and plans that is going to continue some of those good deeds. And you know, there's lots of uh, statements of the Salaf. Uh, they would speak about post-Ramadan. Put the mic forward. Uh, things that the scholars would say about uh, post Ramadan. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, uh, he would say about Eid Day, he would say, Lays al Eidu man labis al Jadid. Eid isn't for the person who wears new clothes. Inna mal Eidu li man khafa yom al Wa'id. Verily, Eid is for the one who fears the promised day. So you're reflecting on your Ramadan, on the day of Eid. You're thinking about Ramadan, you're thinking about what you're going to do now as uh, you know, the rest of the year comes. You're going to be thinking about the day of judgment, accountability, your actions and your deeds. And it's interesting, he speaks about this on the day of Eid, when everyone's gathered together. Just as they're going to be gathered together on the day of judgment, everyone's together, you know, most of the time out in public if the weather's good and everyone's worshiping Allah, praying the Eid Salah. And so it should be a reminder of the day of judgment. And the Salaf, some of the Salaf, they would say, the one who isn't forgiven in Ramadan won't be forgiven outside of Ramadan. That's a general you know, a rule that some of the scholars would mention. Why? Because it's so much easier for a person to do good deeds, to make dua, to supplicate. The mercy of Allah is vast in the month of Ramadan. You know, Allah forgives people in the month of Ramadan more than in other, other, other parts of the year. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is... You know, forgive, forgiving, more forgiving in the month of Ramadan. It's easier for a person to make dua and to supplicate and do good deeds. And so if a person isn't being forgiven in the month of Ramadan, what chances does he have of being forgiven outside of the month of Ramadan? Do you understand? So the point is here that the month of uh, Shawwal and the months following the month of Shawwal are going to be different to the month of Ramadan. And we need to also understand that the next 11 months okay are probably more important than the month of ramadan than that one single month because it's going to dictate uh it's going to dictate how if uh, any if any uh, way ramadan has actually changed us how, how it's affected us because ultimately the scholars they also say that from the signs of an accepted uh, good deed, or from the signs, for example, of an accepted Hajj, or from the signs of an accepted Ramadan, an ibadah in Ramadan, is how you are after Ramadan, after Hajj. That's from the signs, like when a person commits sins and he makes tawbah. If he improves and he's better, that's a sign of an accepted repentance. Likewise with Ramadan. So we need to look at how we're going to change. We need to look at how we're going to improve, how we're going to be different now, because of course we all want our good deeds to be accepted. We all want Allah to you know, have accepted our good deeds. But from the signs of accepted good deeds is that a person changes. For example, he increases in good deeds. For example, he decreases in sins. The bad habits he had before Ramadan, he doesn't continue after Ramadan. He's more consistent and he does new good deeds that he never did before Ramadan. He continues them. Whether it was adhkar, whether it was you know, fasting regularly, whether it was, for example, Quran, whatever the case may be. So he's more active, he's different. And that's from the signs that a person has to show that his Ramadan was accepted. Uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, he would say that the first thing we should start with is lowering the gaze. He says the first thing we should start with is lowering the gaze, lowering the gaze post Ramadan, because you know the scholars they say, the scholars they say uh, another saham in sihami iblis that the sight is an arrow from the arrows of shaitan. Like for men, exactly alain tazni that the eyes commit zina. When a person sees something, okay, with his eyes, that's what causes for men. That's what causes the shahwa and desires. So when he lowers his gaze. He's protecting himself from that aspect of, you know, of sins that he may end up committing. So the things that a person can do post Ramadan is uh, something that I also want us to reflect on and look at, inshallah. So this question, the last question, then inshallah we'll conclude. 
what deeds do you think you can continue post Ramadan? And before we are before we answer this question, uh, do you think we can do the same amount of good deeds after Ramadan than we did in Ramadan? Do you think we could do the same amount of deeds after Ramadan than we did in Ramadan? Okay, who says no? Who says yes? Okay, mashallah. Very optimistic brothers here as well. Then you've got some pessimistic, negative brothers. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with a person having that optimism or a person being practical and realistic. The Prophet ﷺ in the month of Ramadan, would he, do, would he increase in good deeds? Yes. Increase in ibadah. He would increase in ibadah. Kana, uh, he would, uh, he would uh, tighten his belt, an expression, which means he would do even more ibadah. Kana ajwad, he was more generous in Ramadan than he was outside of the month of Ramadan. He was generous anyway. So he would increase in doing good. And of course, we spoke about the barakah and the blessing of Ramadan. And from experience, we know that a person does more in Ramadan than he does outside of the month of Ramadan. So there's that aspect. Now, of course, a person should be optimistic. Like the brother said, you realize your potential. You know, one of the things we need to understand is, yes, it was tiring. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, we felt hungry. Yes, it messed up our schedules. But alhamdulillah, we're still standing. We're completely fine. No issues for the most part. Alhamdulillah, healthy, strong, better than we were before. It had, didn't have like a, no, a long-term mental effect on us or physical effect on our bodies, the sacrifices we made in the month of Ramadan, which should make us show the ability to be able to, you know, carry on doing some aspects of those good deeds. To say, however, that we're going to do the same and to have the same routine as we had in the month of Ramadan when it came to reciting Quran or for our salawat, that might be difficult. And it may end up leading to a person feeling disappointed. Like, let's say you were reading one juz of Quran every single day. I think one only has to reflect, one only has to reflect on the last 10 days of Shawwal and how much Quran we've read compared to the month of Ramadan. Just in these past 10 days, it's only been 10 or so days. So, again, the question is uh, can we do the same amount? It would be very difficult. And even the Prophet ﷺ and the companions would increase. But what we want to do is in some manner continue some of the remnants of good deeds that we did in Ramadan outside of Ramadan. That's the goal. And the key also is to try and be consistent. That's the main thing. To try and be consistent, continue some of those good deeds that we did. So it's about being realistic but it's also about being optimistic. Like uh, not having lofty goals such that we know we're not going to be able to accomplish it based on our experiences as human beings, as Muslims in the past. Okay, But at the same time, having them high enough that we have to challenge ourselves a little bit. Because we have to change our routines, change our schedules slightly. Because Ramadan has taught us we change our schedules. You know, we still, for the most part, went to work and studied and did the things that we were supposed to do and fulfilled our responsibilities, you know, as fathers, as husbands, as people who work. We still did those things. So it is possible. So what I want you guys to do now is ask yourselves, what deeds do you think you can continue after Ramadan? What deeds do you think you can continue to do after Ramadan? So a couple of minutes, inshallah. What deeds do you think you can continue after Ramadan?
Okay, inshallah, so uh, things you can continue after Ramadan. What can you continue to do? Okay, keep keep on top of your salawat, keep uh, uh, focusing on your prayers. Obviously, you know, Qiyam and Taraweeh uh, are they fard? No, they're not fard, but most of us were here praying. Nawafil prayers, optional prayers, voluntary prayers. They're not even obligatory. Which is a good thing, because this means that the uh, the scholars they say from the benefits of voluntary prayers, and even like for example the 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 nawafil and the rawatib salawat, you know the sunnas before uh, the five daily prayers, there there is a specific benefit to them when it comes to the obligatory prayers. How does it? What's the benefit? Allah brings you closer to Allah, but specifically when it comes to the fard prayers. It compensates for them very good. What else? Yeah. It makes up what's missed out. Yes, it compensates. Something else. Yeah. How does how does the rawatib help your fard? If you if if you. Yeah. If a person never misses his rawatib, he never misses his sunnah prayers, his voluntary prayers. Is he, is he going to miss his fard prayers? Never. It's not going to happen. So you look at Ramadan. Okay? A person, if he doesn't go for taraweeh, he'll get stressed. You know, some of us had this goal. We're going to pray in the masjid for taraweeh every single day. This person, like nine times out of ten, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be missing his fard prayers. He wouldn't be missing his fard prayers. He's giving so much importance to his nawafil prayers Okay, that missing or forgetting his fard prayers wouldn't even enter his mind. Like he's giving the the nawafil so much importance that of course naturally the fard prayers are going to be given even more importance. And that's the benefit of the nawafil prayers. So continuing with your salawat, just look at how much effort we made praying our voluntary prayers. Taraweeh and Qiyam. And if a person is able to do that, then he should be able to at least pray his fard prayers, pray, for example, the rawati prayers before and after the obligatory prayers, and everyone's at a different level. Maybe some of us, you know, we struggle with just our fard prayers. We can work on our fard prayers and work on our voluntary prayers, okay, the, the rawati, which will help the fard prayers. Maybe some of us can, you know, solidify our rawati prayers. Maybe some of us can try to pray qiyam. But like I said, everyone is at their own level. Okay, don't compare yourself with the person next to you because we all have different levels, we all on our different journeys, our different paths, our levels of Iman is different. different Everyone's different in terms of their deeds also. So a person needs to look at what's going to help him and how he can strengthen his deed. Yeah, so the salawat, good. Anyone else? Okay, so reciting Quran again, you know, maybe some of us recited one whole Quran in the month of Ramadan, maybe even more than this two or three Qur'ans in, in, in one Ramadan. So this, of course, should encourage a person to recite more outside of Ramadan. Meaning, we're comparing our deeds not to what we did in Ramadan. We should compare our deeds to what we did before Ramadan. This is what we should be doing. Am I doing more now than I was before Ramadan? And even more important, can I remain consistent in these acts because normally of course you know in shawal generally speaking alhamdulillah people do more good deeds they do more good deeds the trick is to try to continue and be consistent until next ramadan can you imagine subhanallah doing a good deed okay uh, consistently post ramadan until the next ramadan comes because it will take what a few months and it will become a habit and once it becomes a habit you have it until the next ramadan Next Ramadan, you can add something else to your repertoire. Add some more good deeds. 
And that, that way, every single year, you're improving as a Muslim. I mean, if the, that should be the basic, you know, basic concept. So a person reciting Quran, again, everyone's at a different level. Maybe for some of us, it's easier to recite Quran than to pray. And so we can increase in our Qiraat al-Quran on, on the way to school or on the way to university or on the way to work and back. You know, when a person's in Salah, for example, or on, you know, before bed or in the morning. So reciting Quran, anything else? At the back. Yeah, good. So fasting. Okay, so staying away from things which are haram and things which are disliked by Allah. But also the point of fasting, it's something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encouraged in the month of Shawwal. We all know, don't we? Shawwal, yeah. Man saw Ramadan, so I took out with Shawwal, for Kanama Sama Dahar, we know the hadith. Whoever fasts Ramadan then follows it up with six days of Shawwal, it's as if he's fasting for the whole year. So this is a benefit. This is something we can use now to try to be consistent in fasting. And I know some brothers, they are you know, at the masjid for every single salah. Every single salah. And it's just part of their routine. Every single salah, they're in the masjid. And I know some brothers, they, they don't, they're not able to do that. And the brother who is at the masjid every single day, I spoke to him once, every salah is at the masjid. And he said, I can't fast outside of Ramadan. Like why? Uh, it's too difficult for me. I'm just not used, it's just not something that I can do easily. But he's in the masjid every single day, five day, five five times a day. Different, different deeds for different people. And there's statements of the scholars, you know, Imam Malik, for example, somebody mentioned, you know, you should pray at night more. And he said, everyone has their way of entering into Jannah. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he was saying. So a person, maybe he has strengths when it comes to salah. But other people, they'll find it easy to fast. It's not a problem. You know, Mondays and these six days of Shawwal, for some of us, six days of Shawwal are going to be harder than the whole month of Ramadan. It's like, it's going to feel so difficult because of course the Barakah isn't there and it's just generally harder. For some it might be, you know, they were doing it before Ramadan, they were fasting anyway, so it's easy. And the scholars differ with regards to how should they be done. Should they be done six consecutively? Some of the madhahib, they say six consecutively. Others, they say as long as it's done in Ramadan, it's fine. You know, some may want to do it every Monday and Thursday so that they can continue Monday and Thursday afterwards. So fasting outside of Ramadan is, I feel like, a good way if a person is able to, to be able to maintain some of those good deeds. Anything else? Over there. Okay, staying away from sins. Again, you know, the scholars, they say, if you can stay away from food and drink, which you need to survive in Ramadan, then it's easier for you to stay away from committing sins. If you can stay away from food and drink, which you need to survive, you can stay away from sins, which you don't need to survive. So, staying away from certain sins and you know busying yourself with good deeds so that they can remove those uh, sins like allah says in al-hasanati you have in a sayyat that righteous deeds extinguish and remove good deeds you know if you always do a good deed after you commit a sin then slowly that sin will start to become less and less of a habit there's an interesting story of a man who was uh, addicted to smoking he just he's always smoking so he went to a scholar and he asked the scholar look i have a problem i can't stop smoking what should i do the scholar said to him every time you smoke perform wudu and pray to rakas he said every time he said yes every single time every make it like a condition like make it something you do for sure that every single time you smoke make sure you do wudu and make sure you pray after it to wipe out that sin so you know some time goes goes by and the man comes back and the imam says to him okay how how, how was it how is it going he says i've given up smoking he says well, what happened he says that every time i smoked i used to do wudu and i used to i used to pray and then when i had the urge to smoke Shaitan would come to me because I was doing wudu and praying every single time. Shaitan knew that if I smoked, I would do wudu and I would pray. So Shaitan would say, you know what, don't, don't even bother smoking. Because that way you're not going to do wudu, you're not going to pray. So just don't bother smoking. 
because you're not going to do wudu and pray there. The lesser of the two goodies, f- f- as far as shaitan is concerned. So I don't want you to do wudu and pray, so just don't even bother smoking. And of course, the, the nafs, the desire as well, the human being, you know, he, he's tempted, he knows, okay, I have to do wudu and pray every time I smoke as a means to r- remove it. So he starts thinking, okay, you know what, I'm not even going to smoke. So he stops committing the sin. This is a clear example of how good deeds remove sins, how good deeds end up removing sins. So, you know, continuing good deeds in whatever capacity we can. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, adhkar, keeping on top of our adhkar. Adhkar al-sabah, adhkar al-masa, the remembrances of the morning and the evening. You know, you have dua books, it's the Muslim, fortress of the Muslim, other books which uh, have those in them. Anything else? Yeah. Charity. Donating, yeah, charity, giving charity. Again, Allah's blessed some of us. Maybe some of us aren't able to come to the masjid for salah every single, you know, for every single salah every single day. Maybe it's hard for us to fast. But some people, Allah has blessed them with wealth. Allah has given them wealth. And, you know, they, they, they'll give charity so regularly that other people won't be able to do this, but Allah has blessed them in this manner. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, if you see in, in when going to Ramadan, this dua, if you don't Allah accept this dua, see or said before Ramadan, after Ramadan, have you changed or not? If you change, Allah accept your dua. Okay, yeah, so it will also affect your dua. If a person improves and changes, then his duas will also be accepted. People think, you know, if I make dua in Ramadan, that's enough, it's fine. And then I'll just go back to how I was after Ramadan, everything will be okay. But again, you know, a person needs to show uh, an active effort to change for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah Azza wa will respond to one's uh, supplications. So these were just some uh, questions which I felt like would help us uh, reflect on the month of Ramadan, post Ramadan, how we can improve, how we can change. And inshallah, hopefully, uh, this will uh, enable us and help us to be able to improve as Muslims. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the ability to be able to be better Muslims post Ramadan. And Allah Azza wa Jalla gives us the ability to be able to witness another month of Ramadan next day, inshallah. Uh, any questions? We do have time for questions. Any questions, inshallah, before we finish? We'll take three questions, inshallah. If there's any questions. Any questions? Going. Going, no questions. Yes, So generally speaking, the brother is asking about how the companions would prepare for the month of Ramadan. Generally speaking, uh, the level of ibadah of the salaf and of the companions was such that when the month of Ramadan did come. It wasn't a case of trying to do ibadah and good deeds. It was just a case of quantity. Do you understand? Because they're already doing good deeds. So they were already praying, as we mentioned, during the night. Qiyam prayer. Ibn Umar, we mentioned the example. You know, for example, fasting. The famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr, radiallahu anh. He would fast every single day. The Prophet said to him, don't fast every single day. Fast Ayam al Bid, the three white days, 13th, 14th, and 15th. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I can do more than this. He said, Then fast Mondays and Thursdays. And he said, I can do more than this. He said, Then fast every other day, one day on, one day off. Years later, when he was old, he said, Oh, I wish I had taken the advice of the Prophet. It's funny I had taken it as his advice because now to fast one day on, one day off is getting very difficult for him. And he didn't want to stop. Why didn't he want to stop? Because the companions, when, like we said, when they started a good deed, they would continue it. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, when the Prophet would do a good deed, amala amalan, athbatahu, he would affirm it. Meaning he would continue to do it. And ahabul amal Allahi adwamuha wa inqad. The most beloved acts to Allah, as the Prophet said, are the ones which are consistent even if they're small. So they, would, they had a habit of doing good deeds. So when Ramadan came, it wasn't like a big deal to just increase. And the culture text, text, you know, uh, makes a difference also. The environment we're in, and we mentioned, for example, the community, everyone worshipping Allah together, and Allah knows best. Okay, I have two in one question. Is this smoking hal- hal- haram or makroom? And second, if your food and eating thing is haram, did Allah accept your dua? What's the first question? As so I was, hal- haram or makroom? As so I was, if you can't eat, 
So the brother is asking about smoking first of all. So smoking is haram because Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Wala taqtul an fusakum," and we know that smoking is something which causes a person to harm himself. And secondly, the brother is asking with regards to uh, his food and drink, and would this affect his du'a? Yes, based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallam of a man who was uh, making du'a in the desert when he was in need of of uh, being saved and rescued by Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the Prophet said, "His clothing is haram, his food is haram, his drink is haram." So how would his du'a be responded to? So a person, based on his income, based on his earnings and based on his his clothing and his food and drink etc there's more chance of a person's du'as being accepted when he has a more sincere and more pure way of living and Allah, Allah knows best jazakumullah khair subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta